Well, I'm uh, obviously privileged, like all of us, to have a chance to visit with uh, Professor Carpentier. Professor, you sat in the audience this morning. I saw you in the audience this morning. Sitting on the podium, I was overwhelmed at 900 individuals here to learn about mitral valve uh, disease and really the operative repair. Um, what's it feel like for you to see you know, what you've postulated all these years and taught us all to have this much of a gathering? Well, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, the, how fast and how deep would be uh, the changes in the mentality of the surgeon uh, with regards to uh, valve disease. I think this has something to do with a uh, current evolution of the society, mm -hmm. and mainly the fact that our society, the people are mainly concerned by quality of life. If I had only one definition uh, to make, comparing the surgery for the, from the past to the surgery uh, of uh, today or tomorrow, I would only say quality of life. And uh, in the past, the people were afraid to have a reoperation. That's why they didn't like right. valve repair or bioprosthetic valve replacement. Today, they say, well, give me a normal life for 10, 15, 20 years so that I can enjoy life. And, uh, and this is, uh, of course, the unexpected uh, success of what I call non thermogenic surgery. Right. So you've been a proponent of not only excellence in cardiac surgery, but this concept of really understanding the mitral valve and repair. To see where it is, to see, I mean, just sitting in the room and seeing 900 people sitting there spending a morning and two days talking about this, it must be very encouraging to you, isn't it? To see, you know, how it's come to that? Well, I have been encouraging the past. <laughs> also, and uh, I would say it, it was mainly a surprise. It is, of course, encouraging, as you said, uh, but it is a surprise, but this is uh, the merit of David Adams, who was able to, he is really in this country as a promoter of uh, these techniques. Uh, there, are, there are very few people having coat the spirit of our reconstruction, because this is really, the term spirit is probably the best uh, to, to express that. And uh, I go back to the beginning by saying that uh, how important is the quality of life. The concept, uh, that in your paper in 1983, you know, most cardiologists, and I'm obviously a cardiologist who images the valves, most cardiologists didn't, had no concept, and I'm, I'm afraid even today many don't, the concept of the incredible structure of the mitral apparatus and how you would repair it. So, you know, you've not only enlightened surgeons, but you've also enlightened cardiologists. And, uh, yeah, we like to, um, I like to, uh to work with cardiologists from the very beginning. You know, they, there is a tendency for surgeons to think that they know everything and that the <laughs> cardiologists don't, don't know anything. Uh, I have a totally different approach and uh, I've been uh, introducing the cardiologists in the operating room, uh, probably the very first in the world. From the very beginning, this was at least at the beginning of the availability of uh, echocardiography. Right. And working as a team is such a gratifying approach and allows you to really improve the, your techniques and, uh, and improve your results. Because the cardiologist is in the operating room, he tells you there is a leak. No, there is no leak. Yes, there is a leak. <laughs> you have to go back. 
Where do you think mitral valve surgery is going in the future? If you had to look down the way or mitral valve disease repair, where is that going in the future? Well, one has to realize that uh, today, 30% of the mitral valve diseases are not uh, 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 oriented uh, to surgery. Right. And uh, these 40% or 35% exactly will uh, be uh, operated on in the future. That's number one. And number two, since the population is uh, getting older, right. we'll see uh, you know, a greater number of uh, people affected by degenerative valvular disease, whatever the type of degenerative valvular disease. So uh, mitral valve reconstruction is going to develop. My concern, because I do have a concern, my concern is that uh, uh, it is uh, a surgery which requires uh, some effort on the part of the surgeon, and uh, it's difficult, more difficult than a valve replacement. So I've been pleased to see the, the move uh, towards valve repair, although valve repair is more difficult, right. at least the one, you know, I think is associated with good result. And, uh, but that's, that's a reward. That is a reward. And, See, this is due to people like David Adams. Well, I think, I mean, you're exactly right. And again, it goes back to your quality issue. In other words, if, yeah. if we know, and you helped educate us, that if you do an excellent repair, that the quality, the effect on the left ventricle, the effect on the right ventricle, the effect on the atrium, the quality of life, and the effect on the patient improves. Tell me a little bit about the, um, your passion with the non-thrombogenic valve um, for which you won the, the whole concept of the Oscar Award. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, the, the concept uh, came from the patient rather than from me, that is to say the patient's request. Um, of course, although valve repair has been associated with tremendous uh, progress, uh, still there are cases uh, which uh, require valve replacement. Now, valve replacement is an easy operation, but it has uh, uh, adverse effects when using mechanical valves. Sure. And I have been confronted uh, in this problem uh, at the very beginning of cardiac surgery or valvular surgery. So I told myself, you know, valve repair, if we can improve it, we will improve it. But what about valve replacement uh, if necessary? And then I began to analyze uh, what could be done. And of course, I went back to the laboratory. And then, uh, as you know, I made some chemistry to uh, improve the durability, to introduce first, and then to improve the durability of uh, animal uh, valves. It's, it's interesting, because I, I, I began medical school in 1965, so it's really at the early stages of valve, yeah, absolutely, of yeah. valve uh, replacement. And um, did, you meet, did you meet resistance from your colleagues as the mechanical valves were coming along and you Certainly, we're going a different route, and people would say, not only um, they're just not going to last. Did you meet resistance from your colleagues over that? Even, well, <laughs> they're not going to last. They're going to fall apart. To say the least. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least, because uh, it was a crazy idea. Oh, it's, absolutely. I mean, using an animal valve absolutely. Uh, to replace a human valve was a crazy idea. And the reason. Uh, I persisted is due to the fact that the crazy idea was non-thrombogenic. And the only downsides or the only limitation was immunological reaction. 
that uh, is to say, uh, we had acute rejection mm -hmm. in animal mm -hmm. before trying to human. So I told myself there are two ways. Using, I want to use these animal valves because they are available with a, so r no risk of infection right. or whatever. So that's why I stick to uh, the animal valve. And also because there, there was a, a larger availability in different sizes. However, there was this uh, problem of immunological reaction. And then I started by uh, trying to think about it. And uh, again, because of the quality of life issue, I told myself instead of treating the patient to reduce immunological reaction, I'm going to treat the tissue. And that's probably the most interesting, intellectually in interesting uh, invention that I've ever done. As you look to the future again and valves in general, where are we going? I don't know. We are looking for different material. There have been, you know, hundreds of different materials uh, used and tried, hoping that they will mimic, you know, the natural uh, tissue. But up to now, there have not been any. But, you know, we should never say never. It will come. For the moment, as far as I'm concerned, I'm following the way I have always, you know, followed, that is to say, trying to improve the durability by improving the methods of preservation. And I mean, we have made uh, significant Dramatic. progress. I mean, many people think uh, bioprosthetic valve will last uh, seven years or eight years, like they did when you were in Stanford. Uh, however, today we see patients, you know, reaching 15, even 20. I do have several patients with the 25, but that doesn't mean that this is the rule. The rule is depends, as you know, depends upon the age of the patient. If you were talking to young surgeons or a young cardiologist, about the practice of their profession, what would you tell them? Um, be good. <laughs> be good. <laughs> In order to be good, work and work and work. But that's not enough. I would say um, you, may, you must be uh, very curious. I mean, uh, an innovator is characterized by his curiosity. Curiosity for me means you have to look around and try to catch and understand all the pending problems. And there are still many mm -hmm. pending problems, anticoagulants, uh, many, many pending problems. So in other words, I see uh, the future uh, of valve surgery or valve pathology or valve treatment uh, for example, I'm sure in, the, in 10 or 15 or 20 years, there will be some techniques, uh, gene technique or, or uh, cell therapy, which, can be, uh, which will be delivered uh, through the locally. I don't know, I, you know, it's, uh, it's always good to dream. Well, I, I, I want to, you've got to go down and give, a, give a, a fascinating lecture, but I want to thank you because you've had uh, two of the three tenets that I think are important in life. You've had a passion for excellence. You've had the concept of being able to give to others, and you think about that. And also the third tenet, which is uh, that people and relationships are very important. You've trained, you've been generous, you've trained others and um, you know we're all the world's a better place because you've been curious and you've and you've worked at being good so thank you very much thank you for these kind remarks